tonight, all the day's major stories here on Prime. The weapons here are being supplied by Iran. On high alert, the Pentagon confirms a U.S. warship shot down three drones when commercial ships came under attack by groups believed to be supported by Iran in the Red Sea. We have the details and how the U.S. military is responding. Plus, my concern is that the Israeli authorities are not treating Palestinian children like children. As the world sees images of Israeli families reuniting after hostages were released by Hamas, tonight we want to take you to the West Bank and East Jerusalem, where some Palestinian families split apart for months are also being reunited. The state of the war and how Palestinians are describing the conditions of their captivity. And I'm always in awe of Sulaika, how she deals with hardship. My first day of chemo, his 11 Grammy nominations were announced. While John Batiste is reaching new heights in his career, it's his family's fight against cancer that has challenged him with his most ambitious project yet. We sit down with a Grammy Award winner on his life, career, and the creation of American Symphony. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more. Including the state of war in Gaza, as Israeli military officials confirm they are now operating in and around a key Gaza city in their attempts to eradicate Hamas. Plus, the first day in court for the Jonathan Majors trial, what we learned in the opening statements about the actor's criminal trial and what prosecutors are alleging. The evacuation's in place after a propane tanker crashed and exploded in Vermont. And it's the newly discovered side effect for Ozempic, and it could have a positive impact for some. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we begin with the escalating tensions in the Middle East days after that temporary truce fell apart. Israel is expanding its ground attacks into southern Gaza, and the U.S. is taking new defensive action in the region. New flyers have warned Palestinians to move to safety once again. Our producer Sammy in Gaza tells us he's had to move his family 17 times now. The number of killed and injured has soared since the temporary truce ended. Desperation is mounting. As for the roughly 2 million residents, there's basically nowhere to go. Israel does not allow Palestinians in, and the Rafah border crossing in Egypt also not open for Gaza residents. And with more than 130 hostages still held in Gaza, there is a renewed focus on the horrors of the October 7th attack and the use of sexual violence as, and rape as a weapon. ABC's Tom Sophie Burge leads us off tonight from Israel. Tonight, civilians caught in the crossfire. With Israel expanding its ground war, pushing deeper into southern Gaza. Palestinians ducking for cover, a family, including that young boy, running for their lives. As bullets pierce the air around them. This was supposed to be an evacuation route. As new satellite images show Israeli military vehicles staging in the south, a sign that their ground invasion into southern Gaza has officially begun. We watched as the IDF pounded Gaza today. Well, we're witnessing a really heavy and constant bombardment into the Gaza Strip. You can see smoke in the distance, airstrikes, artillery. <laughs> Hospitals overwhelmed, children treated on the ground outside. Ibrahim rushing his injured two-month-old son Adnan into the ER saying his family fled south just like they were asked, only to dodge more bombs. What can we do, he asks. Every day we die a million deaths. Tonight, an Israeli military official saying its forces are now moving to encircle the key southern city of Khan Yunis. And after weeks of telling people to move south, where they were told they would be safe, Israel now insisting they are warning people already there, dropping these leaflets with links to maps, urging people to move to designated safe zones. Our producer Sami Zara forced to move his family for the 17th time since the war began. We don't know what to do. There is no safe place at all in Gaza. We press the IDF today on the level of suffering. UNICEF says that even in some of those designated safe zones, children are getting hit and badly injured and killed. We want civilians not to be in the area where we're fighting. We want to focus our firepower on Hamas and Hamas only. And at the United Nations today, Israel presenting evidence they say proves Hamas militants committed crimes of sexual violence as a weapon of war on October 7th. Yoni Sardon survived the festival massacre, telling a British newspaper he saw, quote, a beautiful woman with the face of an angel and eight or ten of the fighters beating and raping her. Their goal is to annihilate Israel. We have no other choice but to eliminate Hamas thoroughly. 
the IDF remaining defiant. Let's get right to Tom in Tel Aviv tonight. Tom, what are you learning about the more than 130 hostages, including Americans who remain in captivity with this assault now back underway? Yeah, Lindsay, given the scale of fighting and intense bombardment of Gaza today, the fate of those remaining hostages is really uncertain. Negotiations for their release have halted. The hostages' families due to meet Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tomorrow. Lindsay? Tom Sufi Burridge for us reporting from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Tom. Joining us now is Dr. Tanya Haj Hassan, a pediatric intensive care physician with Doctors Without Borders. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you've been in contact with medical professionals who are on the ground there in Gaza. Uh, tell us what they've described seeing in the few days since the ceasefire ended on December 1st. Yeah, they, they, they describe um, a horrific situation, bombardment that uh, perhaps even surpasses the brutality uh, of the bombardment prior to the ceasefire. You know, uh, 1.8 million, over 1.8 million Gazans are now displaced to the south. That's over 80 percent of the Gazan population, which prior to October 7th was one of the most densely populated places on Earth. So you can imagine this entire population or the majority of the population now displaced south, living in makeshift left shelters, overcrowded UN schools. Uh, they describe I said something about people living in tents, and they said, we wish it was just tents. People are sleeping on the pavements in the middle of the street. The people in tents are the lucky ones. Mm. And I want to remind you, it's winter now, so it's it's quite cold. They Prior to the end of the, the truce, they described being very cold and out looking for a, a jacket or warm pajamas for their family members, because when they fled, they left with only the clothes on their back. They describe horrible living situations. You know, uh, uh, unable, they're unable to um, unable to dispose of waste. There is no sanitation. There's outbreak of disease, diarrheal disease, respiratory illness. There are reports of hepatitis A. One of my colleagues described being afraid that he was seeing outbreaks of cholera, but there was no way to, to confirm, to test, and. Uh, children very thirsty walking around asking for people to fill their bottle of water because they're thirsty. Uh, people are very hungry. They don't have access to food. And um, the places they're being asked to evacuate, many of them are no man's land. There, there's no access to food or any water, clean mm -hmm. or unclean, the areas they're being asked to evacuate to. So really, it's it's a death sentence. It's a, it's a, a Russian roulette of how you want to be killed. You mentioned a Russian roulette of how you want to die. And, and I am curious, when you talk about the, the medical capacity there, are there functioning hospitals in the north or, or central Gaza at this point? I think it de depends how you define functional. These are some of the most dedicated medical providers I have ever met. So even even prior to the entry of, of, of the little bits of fuel that were coming in, they were continuing to treat patients without electricity, without painkillers. They were continuing to treat patients in any way possible. We received pictures of children with multiple limbs blown off, one or two limbs remaining. This is what they're having to deal with. Of the seven people she said she treated that day in the operating room with amputa bilateral amputations, two of them were children, one age two and one age 11. They're seeing patients coming in with infected wounds from previous inj injuries sustained in the last weeks and dressings that have not been changed because mm. they don't have the capacity, the medical capacity to change them. They've described running out of medications to treat diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, all the chronic diseases that you need regular medications for to maintain or to control the disease, they cannot treat anymore. So patients are dying from things that you otherwise would not die from in a functioning healthcare system. I just want to end with, with, with a, couple of, uh, a couple of things. You know, what, what we're seeing at the moment is such a flagrant disregard for international, international humanitarian law and for civilian life. It, all, it endangers us all, it endangers us all ultimately. It will embolden others to do the same. 
And I just want to say we have to have a permanent ceasefire. Dr. Tanya Hodge Hassan, uh, we so appreciate you just giving a glimpse uh, of the horror that uh, that so many are facing on a daily basis at this point. We thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Now to those defensive measures the U.S. took in the Middle East today. U.S. forces targeted Iran-backed militants inside Iraq who were allegedly preparing a strike on U.S. forces. And through much of the day, the USS Kearney warded off ballistic missiles and drones fired on commercial ships in the Red Sea. The Pentagon says Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen were behind the strikes. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz has more. <laughs> Tonight, the Pentagon revealing it conducted a deadly drone strike on militants in Iraq who the U.S. says were planning to launch a drone attack on American forces. Five of the Iranian-backed militants were killed. It came as a U.S. destroyer in the Red Sea spent more than seven hours on Sunday responding to multiple attacks. It began at 9.15 a.m. local time. The Pentagon said the USS Kearney tracked a ballistic missile fired from Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen, landing in the waters near the cargo ship Unity Explorer. At 12 p.m., the Kearney detects a drone from Yemen heading in its direction, the Navy crew shooting it down. 35 minutes later, the Unity Explorer under fire again. This time, the missile hits the ship. The Kearney responds as another inbound drone is detected and shot down. At 3.30 p.m., a third ballistic missile hits another cargo ship. There is damage reported, but no casualties. One hour later, a fourth ballistic missile hits a third cargo vessel. Again, the Kearney racing to this ship to render aid as yet another drone is launched in the Kearney's direction and shot down. Martha Raditz joins us now. And Martha, the White House is firmly placing the blame for these Houthi attacks on their Iranian backers. Is the White House considering any other kind of response? Well, Lindsay, the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was using some of the strongest language we have heard about Iran, but it's unlikely the U.S. will retaliate against Iran directly for these attacks, given that the Pentagon says they do not believe the USS Kearney was the intended target, although Jake Sullivan made clear that any response by the U.S. will be at a time and place of its choosing. Lindsay? Martha Raddatz for us. Thanks so much, Martha. Tonight, the White House is giving a dire warning to Congress on the war in Ukraine. In a letter to congressional leaders, Office of Management and Budget Director Shalanda Young said the U.S. is, quote, out of money and nearly out of time. The warning comes as President Biden has requested a $106 billion package for the war in Ukraine and Israel in a proposal that is now stalled in Congress. The letter went on to stress a halt in funding could be detrimental to the Ukrainian military and benefit Russia. Tonight, there's shock and outrage after a deadly attack at a Macy's department store in downtown Philadelphia, right in the middle of the holiday shopping season. Stephanie Ramos reports in from Philadelphia. Tonight, with the busy holiday shopping season underway, one security guard is now dead and another one injured after a violent stabbing at a Philadelphia department store. Stabbing at Macy's. According to police, around 1045 this morning, a security guard confronted a man attempting to steal multiple hats inside the Center City Macy's. The man leaving the area, but returning 15 minutes later, armed with a knife. He immediately goes straight towards one of the security guards uh, and then um, redirects his attention to a second security guard, runs directly to that security guard with a knife already exposed and begins to stab him. The suspect running from the scene, apprehended moments later at a train station. Authorities say the two security guards were not armed. One of them, 30 years old, stabbed in the neck. The other, 23 years old, stabbed in the face and arm. Both were rushed to the hospital, the 30-year-old later dying from his injuries. Just a horrific story. Stephanie Ramos joins us now from Philadelphia. Stephanie, what is Macy saying about this incident? Well, Lindsay, Macy's put out a statement saying that the safety and security of their customers and colleagues is their top priority. This location will remain closed. We've also heard from the interim police commissioner who says that this location has been hit hard by retail theft with more than 250 reports filed just this year, Lindsay. All right, Stephanie Ramos for us. Thanks so much.
to Vermont now, where there are evacuations after a tanker truck carrying propane slid off of a bridge and crashed. Miraculously, the driver was not hurt. ABC's Trevor Alt has those details. Tonight, terrifying video shows the flames roaring after that tanker truck hauling 10,000 gallons of propane crashed into a Vermont bridge as a snowstorm moved through. Part of the ATT uh, carrying propane has gone off the road into the river and has exploded. It happened just before 7 this morning in the town of Irisburg, only miles from the Canadian border. Heard this huge, loud, like, explosion bang, and it actually shook our house. Megan Shellifo lives just feet away. I opened up my shades and saw that the opposite side of our bridge, which is right by our driveway, was totally engulfed. Multiple agencies rushing to the scene, fearing an even larger explosion, evacuating a one-mile radius. Two schools dismissing early. Authorities using a drone to monitor the still-engulfed tanker on its side. The road conditions, as everyone knows, were terrible this morning. The crash happening as the region received more than a half a foot of snow in spots. Some dangerous road conditions, it sounds like there. Trevor all joins us now. Trevor, any word on injuries or when people can return home? Yeah, fortunately, Lindsay, so far there's been no reported injuries, not even the driver in this crash. But officials do say this tanker is likely going to burn through the night and may even continue for a couple days. And that means a lot of these people are not going to be able to return home amid all those fears that there could be yet another explosion. Lindsay. All right, Trevor for us. Thanks so much. We head west to California now where a suspected serial killer is charged with multiple counts of murder. The technology used to capture the suspect is also gardening some attention. ABC's Kana Whitworth has those details. Tonight, police in Los Angeles are investigating whether a suspected serial killer charged for the murders of homeless victims is linked to other cases. Based on his criminal history, he didn't just start doing this a week ago. Prosecutors say 33-year-old Jared Powell killed four men over four days three victims while they were sleeping on the streets. It was chilling, the cold-blooded manner in which he walks up and shoots this individual without any hesitation. Police say Powell followed his fourth victim home, robbing and killing the father of two in his own garage. <laughs> Investigators using a controversial technology to track their suspect after his car was captured on an automated license plate reader. We know there's controversy out there about the usage of this system. If we did not enter that plate into the system, this individual that we believe is responsible may have been out there and re-offended. Authorities here in Beverly Hills say essentially they have a perimeter around the city and almost every license plate is checked with more than 2,400 cameras and 70 license plate readers. The police chief calls it precision policing. Do you hear from people about privacy concerns over these cameras? So in this community, I don't hear any concerns. This community is very happy to have the real-time watch center in this technology. More focus right now that he was captured as opposed to how. Kana Whitworth joins us now. Kana, what other information are police looking into when it comes to this suspect? Well, first of all, Lindsay, they say the suspect here is a convicted felon, so they're looking into how he allegedly obtained this murder weapon. There's also a lot of concern among local authorities here that there might be other victims. So right now, Lindsay, they're reaching out to all of their partners in the region. They're asking them to review their past homicide cases and see if any of them fit this profile, Lindsay. Kana Whitworth for us. Thanks so much. The former American ambassador to Bolivia is accused of being a secret agent of the Cuban government. Court documents claim that Manuel Rocha engaged in clandestine activity on behalf of Cuba and that it went on for more than four decades. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the stunning claim by the FBI that Cuba's communist regime had a mole inside the U.S. government for decades. Falsely pledging loyalty to the United States while serving a foreign power is a crime that will be met with the full force of the Justice Department. Victor Manuel Rocha rose to the ranks of the State Department, including a stint as a top diplomat in Havana before becoming the U.S. ambassador to Bolivia. He also held a highly sensitive position on the National Security Council. But the attorney general says at least since 1981, Rocha was really working for Fidel Castro's Cuba in one of the highest-reaching and longest-lasting infiltrations of the U.S. government by a foreign agent. Last year, the FBI became suspicious of Rocha and sent an undercover agent posing as a Cuban intelligence officer to make contact. Rocha allegedly quickly confiding in the agent that his entire diplomatic career was at the direction of Cuba. Quote, 
I went little by little. It was a very meticulous process, very disciplined. The FBI saying Rocha, now 73, called the U.S. the enemy, bragging to the agent, what we have done, it's enormous, more than a grand slam. It was decades. Quite a lengthy amount of time. Pierre Thomas joins us now from Washington. Pierre, do we have any indication of what kind of information he may have received? Well, Lindsay, U.S. officials are trying to determine what classified information Rocha may have given the Cubans. Thus far, they make no allegations that he betrayed his country for money, but instead they say he was a true believer, doing it to help the Cuban communist revolution. Lindsay? Pierre Thomas from our nation's capital. Thanks so much, Pierre. Today, the Supreme Court wrestled with the nationwide settlement of Oxycontin maker Purdue Pharma. The case could shield members of the Sackler family who own the company from civil lawsuits over the toll of opioids. The agreement made between state and local governments as well as victims would provide billions of dollars to combat the opioid epidemic. The Sacklers would also contribute up to $6 billion and give up the company's ownership. The company would ultimately emerge from bankruptcy with its profits used for treatment and prevention. The justices seemed to reluctant to break up the exhaustively negotiated agreement, but also cautious of somehow rewarding the Sacklers. Opening statements began today in the criminal trial of actor Jonathan Majors, who was charged last spring for allegedly assaulting his then-girlfriend during an argument. The opening statement centered on whether the actor assaulted his former girlfriend, Grace Jabari, after she read a romantic text message sent to his phone by another woman. Prosecutors say Majors grabbed the woman's hand so hard he fractured her middle finger, then twisted her arm behind her back and struck her on the side of the head. The outburst won an alleged pattern of physical and emotional abuse. An attorney for Majors argued that their client was the true victim, claiming he was left bloodied by the attack. The case is a rare instance of a misdemeanor assault case going to trial. Majors could face one year in prison if convicted. Now to the big chill on the way for the eastern half of the country tonight as an atmospheric river targets the west with up to 10 inches of rain and two feet of snow. That's on top of 42 inches of snow already in the Rockies. Vail Pass on I-70 was brought to a standstill in Colorado. ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Hey, Ginger. Hey, Lindsay, let's go ahead and dive into this forecast because there were places in the Rockies that had more than four feet of snow over the weekend and they're about to get more. But at the coast, it's going to end up being all rain. So we've got a lot of different alerts on the map, including the avalanche warning in parts of Colorado. But look at the flood watches for much of coastal Oregon and Washington state into the kind of foothills of the Cascades. Well, that's because this next system with the really powerful comma cloud that is so classic brings in all that moisture, but it's going to drop snow levels. And that means people who already got snow will now get rain on top of that snow. So the rivers are going to fill fast and you're going to end up with adding another five to 10 inches of rain as well. So flood watch means through midweek could be dangerous there. Add on top for Idaho, Montana, parts of Colorado, another one to two feet of snow. And that's why it'll be kind of that shift shaping, especially in Colorado with the avalanche threat. Now, when we talk about that cold in the east, over the weekend, we were doing, you know, record highs in South Florida. Now they'll finally clear this front temperature, at least wind chill, going to feel like the 40s, low 40s, so almost 30s there in Orlando, teens and 20s as you get it back up into the northeast, Lindsay. All right, it's that time of year after all. All right, thanks, Ginger. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. What new research is saying about popular diabetes drugs like Ozempic and alcohol addiction? But next, the emotional homecomings for Palestinian youth released after months in Israeli military prisons and the concerns about their treatment behind bars. I don't think that anybody can claim that locking up large numbers of children for long periods of time is either just or helpful. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling 
calling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As we've reported tonight, the temporary pause between Israel and Hamas is over. And during that temporary ceasefire, Hamas freed dozens of hostages and Israel released more than 200 Palestinians held in prisons. Human rights organizations say many of those still being held in those prisons shouldn't be there, especially minors. Now we're starting to hear stories from those who have been released. Our Inez de la Quatara files this in-depth report. <laughs> After nearly 17 months, Qassam and Nasrallah al Awar are back home. In the West Bank and East Jerusalem, Palestinian families split apart for months and years are being reunited. Qassam and Nasrallah were arrested in July 2022 at the age of 16 and 17 after what they say was an altercation with Israeli settlers in their East Jerusalem neighborhood. They say they've been detained by police in the past. The first time that happened, they were just five and six years old. According to the Israeli government, the two brothers' offenses this time included things like support for terrorism and carrying weapons, ammunition, or explosives, charges the two brothers deny. A lot of the charges in the military justice system are vaguely defined and leave a lot of discretion. When you don't have a system with appropriate due process protections, you can be charged with anything um, because there's nobody to, uh, to rein that in. A spokesperson for Israel's prison system telling ABC News, minors in IPS custody have all been imprisoned according to court orders after being charged with serious crimes of various kinds. Data from the Israeli prison system shows roughly 7,000 Palestinians are being held in Israeli prisons, 2,188 sentenced, 2,356 are in pretrial detention. Another 2,873 are being detained without charges. In all, 240 Palestinian women and minors were released before the truce agreement between Hamas and Israel came to an end. There are still an estimated 250 Palestinian minors being detained by Israel, according to the Palestinian Prisoners Club. <laughs> like Fayrouz Salome, who was among the detainees released, whose mother Salinas we met in Ramallah as she eagerly awaited her daughter's return. What was your daughter arrested for? I don't know. Fayrouz receiving a hero's welcome as she got off that bus. Israeli records list her offense as being a harm to the security of the area. While international humanitarian law allows detention without charge in exceptional circumstances, the sweeping use of administrative detention over five decades of occupation it violates all basic principles of due process. <laughs> 14-year-old Abdul Amer, known as Aboot to his friends and family, was the youngest detainee released as part of the exchange. He's wearing a hat to hide the fact that part of his skull is missing.
after he says he was shot by Israeli border police this summer. Israeli police did not immediately respond to our request for comment. Abud says police accused him of throwing a Molotov cocktail at a settler's house, which he denies. He was released before a verdict was issued. My concern is that the Israeli authorities are not treating Palestinian children like children. I don't think that anybody can claim that locking up large numbers of children for long periods of time is either just or helpful. Beyond that, the law is also different for Palestinians and Israelis. Palestinians living in the West Bank are tried in military courts. Israeli settlers illegally living there are tried in civil court. An Israeli child in a settlement next to a Palestinian village throws a stone. That child is tried under the Israeli system. A Palestinian child in the village next door who throws the same stone is subject to a military court system. Pre-trial detention is the norm, and there's a 99.7% conviction rate because the system is so unjust. People will just plea, plead guilty to get out sooner. The difference in that treatment, the blatant discrimination, is, is quite difficult. Palestinians say the two-tier system means detention and incarceration have become a part of daily life. Abud's mother telling us, in late November, two Palestinian boys aged 8 and 15 were shot and killed in what Israel describes as a counter-terrorism operation. The IDF says they only opened fire on those who were throwing explosives at their soldiers. One of the boys didn't appear to have anything in his hands. The other had a small object. Palestinians we spoke with described tough conditions inside the prison, which they say worsened after the Hamas terror attack on October 7th. <laughs> A spokesperson for Israel's prison service saying in a statement, all basic rights required by law are fully applied. We are not aware of the claims you described. Nonetheless, prisoners and detainees have the right to file a complaint, which will be fully examined by official authorities. Over the course of the seven-day ceasefire, more Palestinians were newly arrested than released. As for Abud, he tells us he's now spending time with family, trying to get back to normal. So many desperately trying to just get their lives back. Our thanks to Inez for that. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, increasingly teens are buying drugs through social media, and all too often they are counterfeits made with fentanyl. We talk with grieving parents working to shut down the social media drug sellers. But next, the college football playoff decision that has some fans fuming. We take a look by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America.
America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. No one can get enough of Taylor and Travis. Totally don't think it's fake. I think it's real. Are you kidding? Your personal life is not going to be personal anymore, Travis Kelsey. You are dating Taylor Swift. One, two, three, got me. We've never seen something like this. Everyone went nuts. I think that people are intrigued enough to see what happens with this, especially because it feels like this is a different relationship for Taylor. It's Taylor and Travis, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target? And how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The College Football Playoff Selection Committee has spoken. The playoff matches are set, and while some are celebrating, others are absolutely fuming who's in and who's out by the numbers. January 1, we'll see Michigan face off against Alabama in the Rose Bowl, and Washington will play Texas in the Sugar Bowl. January 8th, the winners will face off for the national championship, notably not in the final matchups. 13-0 Florida State, earning Florida the inglorious title of the first undefeated Power Five champion to be excluded in the 10-year history of the college football playoff format. The committee says this decision was the toughest, but with memories of last year's lopsided 65 to 7 championship trouncing still fresh, concerns about the Seminoles lineup with two Seminole quarterbacks off the roster after late season injuries ruled the day. It's a decision that's left Florida fans indignant. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis posted on X, what we learned today is that you can go undefeated and win your conference championship game, but the college football playoff committee will ignore these results. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. I'm talking with musician John Batiste about his art, his wife's battle with cancer, and how creativity has helped them through. And what happened when a thief tried to steal everything, including the kitchen sink? But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? 
We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights. America's most honored streaming news program. Only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A major airline merger, how Ozempic and other popular weight loss drugs may help curb alcohol addiction, and attention shoppers, there's a deer in aisle three. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. Surprise mega deal taking off in the airline industry. Alaska Airlines, the nation's fifth largest carrier, announcing an agreement to buy Hawaiian Airlines, a deal worth nearly $2 billion. The companies would keep the same names but operate under one CEO. Our combined entity will have more than $13 billion in annual revenue, 365 aircraft, 1,400 flights a day, and serve 138 destinations, including 29 international and over 1,200 destinations globally through our One World Alliance. Analysts say the merger would likely be a win for Hawaiian's customers with more service to North America and Honolulu becoming a hub. The airline's loyalty programs would also combine. I'm running for president because America needs a 180 degree change in the direction where Joe Biden is taking us. North Dakota's Governor Doug Burgum has dropped out of the race for president. The Republican candidate touted himself ready to bring small town values to the big stage. But Burgum struggled in the polls. In a statement, he criticized the RNC for their rules limiting the primary process while saying he will, quote, always remain committed to fighting for the people who make our nation so exceptional. 
Oh dear. At an elementary school in Toms River, New Jersey, police had to chase after this intruder, a deer. According to police, the deer broke through a glass window, causing this pursuit through halls and into a classroom, as if it were late for class. The deer was eventually ushered out through a rear door. And in Corona, California, this scene at a Sam's Club. Dispatch received a number of calls about that deer running through yards, jumping walls, then down the aisles of the store. There goes the officer right behind. Police were able to chase it into the Sam's Club where it ran up and down those aisles. They finally caught it. They consoled the lost deer until animal control arrived. What in the world is Riz? When BuzzFeed asked Tom Holland, he knew. I have no Riz whatsoever. I have limited Riz. I'm locked up, so I'm happy and in love, so I've got no need for Riz. It's a Gen Z term, slang for style, charm, or attractiveness, or the ability to attract a romantic or sexual partner, shorthand for charisma. Oxford University Press named Riz Word of the Year. I have no desire to drink wine anymore. The wildly popular drug used for weight loss, semaglutide, is now showing very early signs of potentially curbing alcohol use for those who drink excessively. A new case study composed of six people screening positive for alcohol use disorder, or AUD, found that they all saw a clinically significant decrease in symptoms while they were using semaglutide for weight loss. Christy Martin, who was not part of the study, says while she used to drink wine every night, her urge to drink has disappeared. And the fact that I just have no desire for it is something I didn't expect and is just an amazing side benefit. This small case study now setting the stage for larger clinical trials as researchers explore whether the drug has the potential to treat other excessive use conditions. This bizarre scene in Excelsior Springs, Missouri. Police racing after a truck hauling a 70-foot mobile home. One officer recounts the moment. He was going about 30 miles an hour. He was hauling his big old house. Police suspected the erratic driving may mean the driver was under the influence. You can see the driver try to evade police. They ended up catching up to the man, and he was taken to jail. Several parents are warning about illegal drugs being sold on social media after losing their children to fentanyl. Now families are working with social media companies to crack down on online drug sales, some even filing a class action lawsuit. ABC's Becky Worley spoke with some of them. Hi, Charlie. Hi. Who are you? Batman. Charlie Turnin was three weeks away from college graduation. But in May of 2020, his parents say he used Snapchat to buy what he thought was a Percocet. He was prescribed Percocet after his back surgery. But they say it wasn't a Percocet. It was a fake pill laced with fentanyl. That night, their priest coming to the door. They said, you know, Charlie died. I'm like, what do you mean Charlie died? <laughs> ah, this, um, they think it's pills. I'm like, pills? So this was Charlie's room? This was Charlie's room. Charlie died of fentanyl poisoning. The Turnins vowing to fight illegal pill sales online, but taking a unique approach. Trying to work with social media companies, approaching Snapchat directly. I think the light bulb moment for them was the deception, right? The fact that our users are being exploited by bad actors who are deceptively marking a, a highly potent chemical as a safe, familiar medicine. Snapchat says it is now proactively filtering out approximately 95% of drug-related content. And as an indication that it's working, they say community flags of drug content related to sales have dropped from 25% to 2%. But the progress so far, not enough for Dr. Laura Berman and her husband, Sam Chapman. They say their 16-year-old son, Sammy, died of fentanyl poisoning in February of 2021. After your kid passes, you want to find a purpose. You want to make their life worth something. We're doing it because we don't want any more kids to die. And every other parent that we've met is really doing it for the same reason. Sammy's parents, now part of a class action lawsuit against Snapchat. Jennifer Park Stout is Snapchat's head of global public policy. More than 50 families are suing Snapchat. What can you tell us about that litigation? My heart goes out to those families and to any family that has suffered really what is an unimaginable loss. 
And through our work at SNAP, we've deployed technologies and tools and created new products that we think will really be effective in combating this problem. She says SNAP is taking action. If an account is flagged as being an account looking to sell drugs that is immediately removed, the content is deleted, the account is then investigated. UC San Diego researcher Timothy Mackey says that dealers use all the platforms, not just Snapchat. They may use Instagram to get as many messages as they can out, so that's their marketing tool. They may use a Telegram account to have a channel where people, you know, as a group, talk about drugs, sell drugs. And while measures to target drug sales online have been raised in Congress... I would demand that the federal government and Congress pass laws to very explicitly make sure that this content is taken down and that there are penalties if those actions aren't taken. Meanwhile, the Turnins say they're educating teens about the dangers of pills, both in schools and through social media. I keep saying to myself, what would Charlie want us to do? Charlie would want us to do good and to help save lives. Charlie is no doubt missed. Our thanks to Becky for that. Legendary musician John Batiste has had a soaring career. He's led a late night band for years, has won the Grammy for Best Album of the Year, and much more. But in early 2022, in the midst of those incredible highs, a life changing low. His wife, New York Times best selling author and Emmy Award winning journalist Sulaika Juad, learned that her long dormant cancer had returned. Their experience is captured in the new Netflix documentary, American Symphony. Let's take a look. We've both had so many good things happening. And the Grammy goes to Sean Batiste. And so many incredibly hard things. Oh, would this remission last years and then come back and we don't know? I honestly don't know how to hold such extremes. We got a chance to sit down with John and Sulaika to discuss how the film captures the two artists at a crossroads in their lives and how creativity has helped put them on a path toward healing. With American Symphony, what made you all decide that you wanted to reveal such an intimately personal side of your lives? Mm. You know, nothing about the experience of going through a serious illness makes you want to share. Mm. Um, but it felt important to show what it's like when you're living a life of extreme contrasts, when you're living your highest highs and your lowest lows um, and navigating so much uncertainty because that's life for so many of us. Mm -hmm. I'm always in awe of Sulaika, how she deals with hardship. My first day of chemo, his 11 Grammy nominations were announced. <laughs> I won the biggest prize in music and come home. She's back in the hospital. This is what we're dealing with. John, take us to that day, because you were talking about the, the contrast of it gets announced, 11 Grammy nominations, mm -hmm. and at the same time, Suleika's going through her first day of, of chemo. Well, there's so much that happened in that day. Mm -hmm. The initial impetus to want to capture this moment on camera was this symphony, which was already weighing on all of us in the best ways and also in the ways that a deadline will weigh on you. <laughs> and that didn't change either, and that was still in process. So it was hard to really think of anything other than forward motion. I have faith that everything can change. My mind is always making things. It's the way that I process my life. If a symphony orchestra was created right now, what would that sound like? We're going to play it one night only at Carnegie Hall. How did the symphony help navigate, for both of you, how did that help you both navigate really the complexities of, of your health journey? So, you know, so often when someone gets sick, we focus on the patient. Mm. But having been through this once before, I knew how an experience like this impacts the entire family unit. And so as much as John or my parents wanted to put things on pause, it felt really important to me that they have their own creative outlets and that they keep with that forward motion. And so I was so excited for John to be able to pour himself into the symphony. And I think music for both of us, especially during that period, gave us something 
that we could connect and talk about that was an illness. Yes, the music for me is is oftentimes a, a way of envisioning the world the way that I want to see it. Mm. And thinking about American Symphony and a masterwork, something that takes, for me, it's taken 25 years to even have the audacity to compose something like this. And to make it real in the midst of this felt almost as if we were making the reality of our family and her healing real. Obviously, so like you're a best-selling uh, writer, author. Uh, how has, has writing um, and, and you finding yourself back in this predicament health-wise for a second mm -hmm. time, how has that influenced your, your work? So creativity for me has always felt miraculous. You get to make something where there wasn't something before mm. and behold it. And I think that's true of these moments, these life interruptions that we all go through. Uh, be it illness or some other experience that brings you to the floor. What do you both <laughs> hope that people will take away from American Symphony? Mm. I think how amazing Sulaika is, my wife, is incredible. I hope they take away the possibilities of the canon of music and the possibilities of music beyond its entertainment value. Obviously, you have six more Grammy nominations, including Best Album, uh, once again. A new song, um, It Never Went Away. Tell us about the inspiration for It Never Went Away. Right here. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we met at band camp. What year was that? 2000? <laughs> We were 12, 13, yeah. <laughs> so it never went away. I mean, we worked <laughs> together for that long, but we were together for a while, and, and it's been a, a journey. The documentary captures this journey, but even way before that, this song was something that came from our journey together in the lullabies that I composed for Sulaika when she was in the hospital, which was a part of that period of when we were filming. As she would paint, I would write these lullabies, and the songs, it never went away. I feel a strong, strong desire to take the pain away. But I can't. This is a moment, a test. And it's nobody's fault, and nobody can control it. Clearly, as you all have talked about even now, uh, one of the themes of the documentary is healing. Mm. And I think a lot of people are going are, are to want to know, how are you now? Mm. I'm doing well. I'm here. I'm feeling strong. Um, but, you know, one of the things that my oncologist told me was, you have to live every day as if it's your last. Mm -hmm. And I tried doing that. And um, instead of you know, feeling like I was seizing the moment, it was putting me in a place of panic. Mm. Um, and so instead I've had to shift in recent months as I navigate this ongoing treatment um, to the idea of living every day as if it's my first. What's next for both of you? I know what's next for Sulaika. <laughs> you, lots of great work on the way. <laughs> I'm working on a couple of books and continuing to paint. Um, but also, you know, I think an experience like the one that we went through really reshuffles your priorities mm. and reroutes your perspective to what really matters. Mm. Well, I thank you all both so much for bearing your souls in American Symphony. It was really, really well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, it's great to be with you. So enjoy that conversation. Our thanks to John and Sulaika for that. American Symphony is now available to stream on Netflix. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the latest on a deadly volcanic eruption in Indonesia. The evacuations and search rescue efforts now underway. And it's a tropical vacation nightmare, a shark attack at a popular Bahamas resort. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts.
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. No one can get enough of Taylor and Travis. Totally don't think it's fake. I think it's real. Are you kidding? Your personal life is not going to be personal anymore, Travis Kelsey. You are dating Taylor Swift. One, two, three, got me We've never seen something like this. Everyone went nuts. I think that people are intrigued enough to see what happens with this, especially because it feels like this is a different relationship for Taylor. It's Taylor and Travis, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including the state of war in Gaza. As Israeli military officials confirm, they are now operating in and around a key Gaza city in their attempts to eradicate Hamas. Plus, how the U.S. government discovered a former U.S. ambassador was acting as a Cuban agent for 40 years and the evacuations in place after a propane tanker crashed and exploded in Vermont. But we do begin with the escalating tensions in the Middle East days after that temporary truce fell apart. Israel now expanding its ground attacks into southern Gaza, and the U.S. is taking new defensive action in the region. New flyers have warned Palestinians to move to safety once again. Our producer Sammy in Gaza tells us he's had to move his family now 17 times. The number of those killed and injured has soared since the temporary truce ended. Desperation is mounting, as for the roughly 2 million residents, there's essentially nowhere to go. ABC's Tom Sufi Burge leads us off once again tonight from Israel. Tonight, civilians caught in the crossfire, with Israel expanding its ground war, pushing deeper into southern Gaza. Palestinians ducking for cover, a family, including that young boy, running for their lives. The bullets pierce the air around them. This was supposed to be an evacuation route. As new satellite images show Israeli military vehicles staging in the south, a sign that their ground invasion into southern Gaza has officially begun. We watched as the IDF pounded Gaza today. Well, we're witnessing a really heavy and constant bombardment into the Gaza Strip. You can see smoke in the distance, airstrikes, artillery. Hospitals overwhelmed, children treated on the ground outside. Ibrahim rushing his injured two-month-old son Adnan into the ER, saying his family fled south just like they were asked. 
only to dodge more bombs. What can we do, he asks. Every day we die a million deaths. Tonight, an Israeli military official saying its forces are now moving to encircle the key southern city of Khan Yunis. And after weeks of telling people to move south, where they were told they would be safe, Israel now insisting they are warning people already there, dropping these leaflets with links to maps, urging people to move to designated safe zones. Our producer Sami Zara forced to move his family for the 17th time since the war began. We don't know what to do. There is no safe place at all in Gaza. We pressed the IDF today on the level of suffering. UNICEF says that even in some of those designated safe zones, children are getting hit and badly injured and killed. We want civilians not to be in the area where we're fighting. We want to focus our firepower on Hamas and Hamas only. And at the United Nations today, Israel presenting evidence they say proves Hamas militants committed crimes of sexual violence as a weapon of war on October 7th. Yoni Sardon survived the festival massacre, telling a British newspaper he saw, quote, a beautiful woman with the face of an angel and eight or ten of the fighters beating and raping her. Their goal is to annihilate Israel. We have no other choice but to eliminate Hamas thoroughly. The IDF remaining defiant. Let's get right to Tom in Tel Aviv tonight. Tom, what are you learning about the more than 130 hostages, including Americans who remain in captivity with this assault now back underway? Yeah, Lindsay, given the scale of fighting and intense bombardment of Gaza today, the fate of those remaining hostages is really uncertain. Negotiations for their release have halted. The hostages' families due to meet Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tomorrow. Lindsay? Tom Sufi Burridge for us reporting from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Tom. Now to those defensive measures the U.S. took in the Middle East today. U.S. forces targeted Iran-backed militants inside Iraq who were allegedly preparing a strike on U.S. forces. And through much of the day, the USS Kearney warded off ballistic missiles and drones fired on commercial ships in the Red Sea. The Pentagon says Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen were behind the strikes. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz has more. <laughs> Tonight, the Pentagon revealing it conducted a deadly drone strike on militants in Iraq, who the U.S. says were planning to launch a drone attack on American forces. Five of the Iranian-backed militants were killed. It came as a U.S. destroyer in the Red Sea spent more than seven hours on Sunday responding to multiple attacks. It began at 9.15 a.m. local time. The Pentagon said the USS Kearney tracked a ballistic missile fired from Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen, landing in the waters near the cargo ship Unity Explorer. At 12 p.m., the Kearney detects a drone from Yemen heading in its direction, the Navy crew shooting it down. 35 minutes later, the Unity Explorer under fire again. This time, the missile hits the ship. The Kearney responds as another inbound drone is detected and shot down. At 3.30 p.m., a third ballistic missile hits another cargo ship. There is damage reported, but no casualties. One hour later, a fourth ballistic missile hits a third cargo vessel. Again, the Kearney racing to this ship to render aid as yet another drone is launched in the Kearney's direction and shot down. Our thanks to Martha for that. Tonight, there is shock and outrage after a deadly attack at a Macy's department store in downtown Philadelphia, right in the middle of the holiday shopping season. Stephanie Ramos reports from Philadelphia. Tonight, with the busy holiday shopping season underway, one security guard is now dead and another one injured after a violent stabbing at a Philadelphia department store. Stabbing at Macy's. According to police, around 1045 this morning, a security guard confronted a man attempting to steal multiple hats inside the Center City Macy's. The man leaving the area, but returning 15 minutes later, armed with a knife. He immediately goes straight towards one of the security guards uh, and then um, redirects his attention to a second security guard, runs directly to that security guard with a knife already exposed and begins to stab him. The suspect running from the scene, apprehended moments later at a train station. Authorities say the two security guards were not armed. One of them, 30 years old, stabbed in the neck. The other, 23 years old, stabbed in the face and arm. Both were rushed to the hospital, the 30-year-old later dying from his injuries.
Really tragic. Our thanks to Stephanie for that. Evacuations in Vermont after a tanker truck carrying propane slid off a bridge and crashed. Miraculously, the driver was not hurt. ABC's Trevor Alt has the details. Tonight, terrifying video shows the flames roaring after that tanker truck hauling 10,000 gallons of propane crashed into a Vermont bridge as a snowstorm moved through. Part of the ATT unit carrying propane has gone off the road into the river and has exploded. It happened just before 7 this morning in the town of Irisburg, only miles from the Canadian border. Heard this huge, loud, like, explosion bang, and it actually shook our house. Megan Shellifo lives just feet away. I opened up my shades and saw that the opposite side of our bridge, which is right by our driveway, was totally engulfed. Multiple agencies rushing to the scene, fearing an even larger explosion, evacuating a one-mile radius. Two schools dismissing early. Authorities using a drone to monitor the still-engulfed tanker on its side. The road conditions, as everyone knows, were terrible this morning. The crash happening as the region received more than a half a foot of snow in spots. Slick roads there. Our thanks to Trevor. We head west to California where a suspected serial killer is now charged with multiple counts of murder. The technology used to capture the suspect is also garnering attention. ABC's Kana Whitworth has the details. Tonight, police in Los Angeles are investigating whether a suspected serial killer charged for the murders of homeless victims is linked to other cases. Based on his criminal history, he didn't just start doing this a week ago. Prosecutors say 33-year-old Jared Powell killed four men over four days, three victims while they were sleeping on the streets. It was chilling, the cold-blooded manner in which he walks up and shoots this individual without any hesitation. Police say Powell followed his fourth victim home, robbing and killing the father of two in his own garage. Investigators using a controversial technology to track their suspect after his car was captured on an automated license plate reader. We know there's controversy out there about the usage of this system. If we did not enter that plate into this system, this individual that we believe is responsible may have been out there and re-offended. Authorities here in Beverly Hills say essentially they have a perimeter around the city and almost every license plate is checked with more than 2,400 cameras and 70 license plate readers. The police chief calls it precision policing. Do you hear from people about privacy concerns over these cameras? So in this community, I don't hear any concerns. This community is very happy to have the real-time watch center in this technology. Our thanks to Kena. The former American ambassador to Bolivia is accused of being a secret agent of the Cuban government. Court documents claim that Manuel Rocha engaged in clandestine activity on behalf of Cuba and that went on for more than four decades. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the stunning claim by the FBI that Cuba's communist regime had a mole inside the U.S. government for decades. Falsely pledging loyalty to the United States while serving a foreign power is a crime that will be met with the full force of the Justice Department. Victor Manuel Rocha rose to the ranks of the State Department, including a stint as a top diplomat in Havana before becoming the U.S. ambassador to Bolivia. He also held a highly sensitive position on the National Security Council. But the attorney general says at least since 1981, Rocha was really working for Fidel Castro's Cuba in one of the highest reaching and longest lasting infiltrations of the U.S. government by a foreign agent. Last year, the FBI became suspicious of Rocha and sent an undercover agent posing as a Cuban intelligence officer to make contact. Rocha allegedly quickly confiding in the agent that his entire diplomatic career was at the direction of Cuba. Quote, I went little by little. It was a very meticulous process, very disciplined. The FBI saying Rocha, now 73, called the U.S. the enemy, bragging to the agent, what we have done, it's enormous, more than a grand slam. It was decades. Our thanks to Pierre for that. A day spent paddleboarding at sea turned deadly for one American mom in the Bahamas. A shark bit her on the right side of her body while she was with a relative. ABC's Victor Akendo has these details. Tonight, the shocking scene in the Bahamas. An American tourist killed by a shark this morning while paddleboarding near the popular Sandals Royal Bahamian Resort in New Providence. Police saying the woman was visiting from Boston. She was about three quarters of a mile offshore when she was attacked. A lifeguard racing out to the victim in a rescue boat 
bringing her and a male relative back to the beach. CPR was administered to the victim. However, she suffered serious injuries to the right side of her body, including the right hip region and also her right upper limb. The woman, who police say was in her 40s, did not survive. Although rare, most shark attacks in the Caribbean occur in the Bahamas. Just last month, a 47-year-old tourist from Germany was killed during a diving expedition. And in June, Heidi Ernst, a tourist from Iowa, lost her leg while scuba diving when a shark attacked. Sandals saying they are deeply saddened by their guest's tragic passing and are offering all support possible. Lindsay? So sad, Victor, thank you. Now to the big chill on the way for the eastern half of the country tonight as an atmospheric river targets the west with up to 10 inches of rain and two feet of snow. That's on top of 42 inches of snow already in the Rockies. Vail Pass on I-70 was brought to a standstill in Colorado. ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Hey, Ginger. Hey, Lindsay, let's go ahead and dive into this forecast because there were places in the Rockies that had more than four feet of snow over the weekend and they're about to get more. But at the coast, it's going to end up being all rain. So we've got a lot of different alerts on the map, including the avalanche warning in parts of Colorado. But look at the flood watches for much of coastal Oregon and Washington state into the kind of foothills of the Cascades. Well, that's because this next system with the really powerful comma cloud that is so classic brings in all that moisture, but it's going to drop snow levels. And that means people who already got snow will now get rain on top of that snow. So the rivers are going to fill fast and you're going to end up with adding another five to 10 inches of rain as well. So flood watch means through midweek could be dangerous there. Add on top for Idaho, Montana, parts of Colorado, another one to two feet of snow. And that's why it'll be kind of that shift shaping, especially in Colorado with the avalanche threat. Now, when we talk about that cold in the east, over the weekend, we were doing, you know, record highs in South Florida. Now they'll finally clear this front temperature, at least wind chill, going to feel like the 40s, low 40s, so almost 30s there in Orlando, teens and 20s as you get it back up into the northeast, Lindsay. All right, it's that time of year after all. All right, thanks, Ginger. A big change at the southern border today. Federal officials temporarily closed down one border crossing in Arizona after a large influx of migrants forced them to divert more resources to the area to assist in processing them. All this comes as across the country, cities are grappling with an increase in asylum seekers. ABC's Irene Shaw has this story. This morning, U.S. Customs and Border Protection officials suspending operations at a border crossing in Lukeville, Arizona on Monday to free agents to deal with increased levels of migrant encounters. Over 17,000 migrants apprehended in the Tucson region over one week, compared to just over 23,000 encounters in the entire month of November last year. CBP transporting some of those migrants to other parts of the border for expedited removal. This coming after Texas officials temporarily suspended vehicle operations at one crossing in Eagle Pass last week. Volunteers across the country opening doors despite the increased numbers as winter approaches. We want to walk alongside them, work with them. The top CBP official telling ABC last week that decreasing or suspending processing at ports of entry is one way they can redirect resources to deal with apprehensions. This is uh, you know, how we manage our operations. We, uh, we search to those locations we have to um, for the safety and security of our officers, our agents, the, mi the migrants we encounter, and, and frankly, to maximize the enforcement efforts uh, that we have underway. And Texas must now remove a thousand foot long barrier installed in the Rio Grande in July. This decision on Friday coming after a federal appeals court ruling the state must remove the buoys. Our thanks to Zareen. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime coming up. She lived her final days to the fullest. One woman's determination not to let terminal breast cancer make her bitter and her parting words of wisdom for us all. But next, a look at the places U.S. border officials are closing crossings from Mexico in response to rising numbers of migrants. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. 
reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling for this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The death toll from floods in northern Tanzania following torrential rains this weekend has risen to 63, adding to hundreds of other deaths caused by extreme weather in East Africa since seasonal rains began in October. The flooding comes on the back of the worst drought to hit the region in 40 years. Dry soil is less capable of absorbing water, increasing the risk of flash flooding. Three survivors were found in Indonesia after a volcano erupted. Rescue teams recovered 11 bodies out of 75 climbers who were in the area at the time of Sunday's eruption. Another 49 climbers evacuated and many were being treated for burns. Indonesia sits on the Pacific's so-called Ring of Fire and has 127 active volcanoes, according to the Volcano Agency. Venezuelans approved a referendum called by the government of President Nicolas Maduro to claim sovereignty over an oil and mineral rich area of neighboring Guyana that it argues was stolen when the border was drawn more than a century ago. It remains unclear how Maduro will enforce the results of the vote, but Guyana considers the referendum a step toward annexation and the vote has its residents on edge. Teachers across the country are raising concerns over a nationwide literacy crisis. But in Mississippi, a promising plan is not only turning the page on progress in the state, the so-called Mississippi miracle could change the landscape for the rest of the country. I teach seventh grade. They are still performing on the fourth grade level. This morning, thousands of teachers across the country taking over TikTok to express a troubling classroom reality. These kids can't read. They can't decode. They have no vocabulary, no background knowledge. I've never seen anything like it. Students increasingly falling behind too late, not reading at grade level. The consequences dire, with over one in five American adults still struggling to read. I can use two and four animation and live action. It's during reading class here at Jefferson County Elementary, 75 miles south of Jackson in rural Mississippi. What was that vocabulary word that we were talking about? Independence. Independence. Where third graders like McKinley Elise Reed are setting an example. One day once I grow up, I want to be a, I want to be an officer. The nine-year-old and her classmates redefining the state's literacy landscape, notoriously known for its reading levels ranking at the bottom nationwide. They were very low. We had to teach children how to find the main idea when they couldn't even read. Mississippi ranking second worst in the country in 2013, then climbing up to 21st last year. Principal Shamika Woods, who's dedicated her 13-year career to the once failing district, crediting the complex statewide strategy for their success. To come up like that feels great because we have worked extremely hard to implement this curriculum. The Literacy-Based Promotion Act 
implementing a multi-layered plan. I want you to pretend like you're going to tell someone at home about what you learned today. Which includes pairing teachers with trained literacy coaches like Katie Williamson. We're really focusing on helping teachers build their capacity, supporting teachers, making sure that they have the trainings they need, whether it be with the curriculum or the different strategies for classroom management. Also emphasizing the basics of phonics with high quality instructional materials. Teachers don't have to pull from everywhere. Everything is right there and all they have to do is follow the script. Phonics is literally the foundation of reading. The word would be math. We would tap out those sounds or phonemes. So we would say mm, ah, Plus, prioritizing early testing, individual reading plans, and a heavy push on parent engagement. Good job, good job. Y'all did good today. Now witnessing the fruit of their labor, students at Jefferson County Elementary are not afraid to share their love for literature. Reading, reading, reading. reading. Garnering the most improved reading scores for a state-supported school. When I came here, I said I come in only knowing one thing. I know that we are only 42% pass rate. And I said, so that, that's a goal for us. And then by the end of the retest, we had 100% pass rate. Students like McKinley. Scissors and super glass. Eager to participate in the hands-on after-school literacy club. You going to do this for you? Yes, ma'am. Reaching new heights in their creativity and love for reading. Reading should be something they want to do, but not something that they're forced to do. Reading will take them places. If you can read, you can accomplish anything. Love to see all that progress. Our thanks to Robin Roberts for that. And still to come, we are paying tribute to a woman who reminded all of us about the importance of enjoying the moment and cherishing our loved ones. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, yeah. every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, she was an example of gratitude personified. But last week, Michelle Earle lost her battle with breast cancer, leaving behind quite a legacy. <laughs> 18 months ago, when 55-year-old Michelle Earle, a mother of three from Wisconsin, was diagnosed with an aggressive breast cancer, she didn't let the doctor's prognosis decrease her faith. It would have been really easy to lose hope and lose faith. But then what happened was I just changed what I was dreaming about. One, two, three. Her dreams of tomorrow became her plans for today as she embraced the time she had left. Michelle and her husband Joe made a conscious decision to love every moment, creating a bucket list, crossing off each and every item, <laughs> including skydiving, a family trip to Hawaii, taking a hot air balloon ride together. That was amazing. And getting baptized again. <laughs> Michelle and Joe also gave back, walking with supporters to raise more than $12,000 for the American Cancer Society. Last Sunday, surrounded by dozens of her family and friends, there's Michelle watching our America Strong segment. Two days later, she passed away. 
but not before her story inspired people from around the world to send messages to her family, noting Michelle's strength and positivity. And the message is to love every moment and not waste time because you can't get it back. Their neighbors' homes now lit up in pink in honor of Michelle and the countless others battling breast cancer. Her husband, with some of Michelle's words of wisdom. Do not wait for someday, make someday today. Laugh with others, but most importantly, laugh at yourself and be vulnerable in life and love. Great advice for us all. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.